Good evening and a very warm welcome, and it's slightly warmer than it is outside, which is a great bonus. Welcome to the largest church crypt in Europe, although because it's divided up into small bits you may not realize. Uh, but this is part of Christopher Wren's great masterpiece, St. Paul's, and we're delighted that you're able to join us here this evening for this important conversation as we consider what kind of city we want to be. We're welcoming our friend Bishop Sarah Mullally to the cathedral for her first formal event with our institute. Sarah, I was having breakfast with Sarah this morning and she survived all day and that's a good sign. <laughs> and each of you are very welcome to be here tonight. Wherever you're from, whatever you think or believe, it's great to have you here. Our doors as a cathedral are open for people every day. And if you work nearby, and here comes the advert, uh, if you work nearby, this place of reflection and reverence is somewhere where we hope you might want to come and find some peace and calm, either on the way to work in our morning services or in the early evening at Choral Evensong, or just to come in to be quiet in the midst of the busyness and pressure of working life. We can offer ourselves, our space, and our rhythms to you as somewhere that is a rhythm of retreat and comfort for you. We're here as part of the Democracy and Common Good series of events and conversations convened by the St. Paul's Institute as we seek how to consider best to develop public policy and discourse in a way that holds together individual fulfillment with mutual flourishing together as a society based on the dignity and equality of everyone. And tonight we're considering the question, who is welcome here? A question particularly important at this time of enormous transition, a transition which we're at the moment uncertain as to the nature of it, which adds pressure to an already uncomfortable process and a very messy narrative. And we saw another piece of the mess emerging this morning. Freedom of movement of labor and capital has gone from being a slightly geeky technical issue to a hugely live and pertinent debate. It matters enormously where we'll be allowed to live and work and who is going to be permitted to live and work here. And none of us, none of us, is going to be unaffected by what is happening about borders, migration, and the future of labor. As we consider the future of our city and the nature of the welcome we offer or not to our neighbors, I'm delighted we'll be hearing from various city leaders joining us. And chairing tonight's discussion is Katie Harrison. Katie leads Comres, the Faith Research Center, and is helping out at the Institute for a few months. And she's going to be looking after the discussion. Editor of City AM, Christian May, brings sharp political and economic observations. Bernard Donahue of the Association of Leading Visitor Attractions, he's the one on the end with the beard. Uh, will help us think about the many different kinds of visits which millions of people make to our capital. And Dr. Adrian Pabst, who wrote the report, sitting next to Bernard, is with us this evening too. You'll be invited to submit questions using the cards that you've been given on the way in. During the event, these will be collected and a few will be selected. And if your question is going to be asked, you'll be called to the microphone to ask your question briefly for the panel to respond. And afterwards, I very much hope you'll join us for a drink in the crypt afterwards to conclude the evening. Please now join me in welcoming to bring her reflections on these important issues, Bishop Sarah Mullally, Bishop of London. Good evening. It's uh, lovely to be with you this evening on what I think is a really important conversation that we need to be having at this time. Part of the reason for smiling this evening is that, in fact, I've just returned from a week's leave. Uh, it was in Sicily, and on our arrival into Sic Sicily, the first thing I was asked was not what is the purpose of your visit or where were you staying, but... What about Brexit then? We stand at an important moment in not just our nation's history, but in the history of Europe. There have been few other times in our lifetime which have been more dramatic, polarizing, or unsettling. 
But of course, division is not new. Historically, we have found ourselves to have unbearable, seemingly irreconcilable differences before, and I'm absolutely certain that we will again. In this report, Democracy and the Common Good, which was produced last year by the St. Paul's Institute here at the Cathedral, we are challenged in, on our use of binary narratives. Adrian, in his preface, reminds us that following the Brexit referendum and the political turmoil in the USA, in the United Kingdom, and many other European countries, the old opposition of left versus right seems increasingly obsolete. Instead, Adrian goes on to say that we risk substituting one binary world for another, one in which the main fault lines are cultural and generational, encapsulated by the networked metropolitan youth versus the old left behind. The report calls for a politics and a broad public discourse based on a different language and a transcendent conversation, one that can address deeper discussions around the questions of meaning and belonging. However, we all know that it's not as easy as it sounds. If it were, we would have done it by now. Instead, we inevitably hunker down with our own, and in consolidating our own sense of belonging within our own communities of whatever kind, we differentiate ourselves from others. We set ourselves apart. And the truth is the church is no exception. We use language which not everyone may understand, such as redemption, salvation, sinner. And as we do so, we draw explicit or implicit categories which indicate who is in and who is out. But as Christians, alongside other people of faith and of goodwill, we live in and serve the whole of this city. And we are, not odds at, we are not at odds with it. We are here to serve it and to bless it, to carry hope and peace, and to demonstrate the love of God to everyone. We are servants and neighbours to those around us. Our challenge in this time is not to pretend that we are all alike. We are clearly not. But we need to recognise and hopefully learn in some small way to overcome our intrinsic nature which pushes others away and tries to carve out our own territory for ourselves. Rabbi Lord Sachs chart, charts very beautifully and comprehensively the concept of sibling rivalry in the Aramaic faith right from the beginning when two brothers, Cain and Abel, come to blows. We have been pushing away the closest people to us. The story of Cain and Abel gives us a no one to blame situation. There is no peer pressure, no one else to impress, no money or land to claim. Simply one person, jealous of the other. He thought he was being overlooked by God. What about me might have been his thoughts as envy ate him up and so he killed his brother. Scripture tells us that from the very outset this has been our struggle. Again, the church experiences this tension as we do in all communities and institutions. Here in the church at times as elsewhere we find ourselves at odds with each other. When we gather for occasions like this to rally ourselves to live more graciously together, we are fighting against a deeply held instinct. This is not an easy problem to solve. It has been with us in one manifestation or another throughout our whole history. Jesus answers a question about the path to eternal life with the exhortation first to love God utterly and completely and then to love your neighbour as yourself. 
we are here this evening to consider who is our neighbour. And I'm looking forward to the discussion with the panel to see how we can approach translating this into our workplaces, our city infrastructure, our housing, our public discourse. But Jesus uses a very few words to say a great deal, as he so often did. We are called to love our neighbours as ourselves. One of the messages that I think we need to hear loud and clearly from the Brexit referendum discussion and the decisions that we have since seen in our neighbouring countries is, what about me? What about me? In the last two years, we've heard a lot of people all around the UK who have felt forgotten, left behind, overlooked, overlooked by employers, the public services and the politicians, people who have expressed their concern that in welcoming others, we have assumed that everyone already here will quickly be able to adjust to new neighbours, different languages, different languages spoken on our streets, unfamiliar foods in our supermarkets. Those who fear the future because of its unfamiliarity, because of low pay jobs, because of insecure unemployment opportunities, because of intergenerational poverty, which offers little hope of financial prosperity. As neighbours here in London, we find ourselves to be people from many different countries, religions and cultures. Among us are people whose families have always lived here, who grew up knowing everyone in their community, understanding the conversation they overheard in the street. All of these people are our neighbours. As we ask who is welcome here, we must recognise that loving our neighbours as ourself means that both parties flourish. I believe that the diversity of London should be our strength. It is a strength and not a hindrance. Living and working alongside many different kinds of people offers opportunities for us to learn, to grow, to enjoy a varied uh, life, interesting ways to celebrate with each other, comfort one another, cheer each other on. Our concept of the common good, of putting relationships and mutual benefits at the heart of our decisions and our conversations, challenges us to receive as well as to give. It may be more blessed to give than to receive, but some of us need to learn that it's okay to receive from others sometimes. I wonder what it feels like if we put ourselves into the place of the man traveling on the road from Jerusalem to Jericho, the man who was attacked, the man who fell amongst thieves, the one who needed help. What must it have been like to receive help, not from the people you thought would have come to your aid, but from the most unlikely person? How would I react if someone who is supposed to be the other, the unacceptable person in society, if that person saw me at my most vulnerable, saw, bleeding, crying, needy, and then helped me to find safety and healing? As one of my colleagues, the Bishop of Kensington, Dr. Graham Tomlin, has recently said, in, res in responding to the tragedy of Grenfell Tower. The Christian's view of social relations tell us that my neighbour is not so much a threat or a limitation, but a gift. If my own individuality is constituted by my relationships, not by my own inner elusive personality or choices, then without my neighbour, I cannot become fully myself. What an image, the neighbour as my gift. Our relationships, locally and informally, as well as as the big public moments, form the basis of who we are and how we live. Who is welcome here? Who welcomes you? 
Who do you welcome? Who shall we welcome together? These are not simply high ideals or abstract questions. As the work of unconscious bias indicates, a city prospers when we work together in diverse teams, bringing together various backgrounds and cultures. The work of McKinsey's found that companies in the top quartile for ethnic diversity were 35% more likely to generate above average returns. And so we consider this evening how our city's infrastructure, our, how our employment practices, our banking systems help all of us, whoever we are and wherever we come from, to flourish. What does our social housing policy tell us about who is welcome here? When we move our more affordable housing out of the capital, what does that say to people I can see on the tube in the early mornings, traveling very long distances to low paid cleaning jobs or staffing security in our buildings where some of our country's highest paid people work? What do our employment practices tell us about who is welcome here? When we fail to regulate employment agencies and check whether they abide by the resident labor market test, what does it say to people who grew up and were educated here, but are overlooked by employers who recruit directly from abroad, effectively contravening legal requirements to advertise domestically first? What do our bankings, banking systems tell us about who is welcome here, when the flow of hot money unsettles the markets and incentives short-term speculation? What does that say to people who are saving hard for a first-time home but can't afford to live in London because property prices are skewed by investors and property developers seeking quick wins? Our discussions tonight about neighbours and welcome is not purely theological or a comfortable fireside chat. We have some gritty realities to face about our economy our infrastructure, and our policy making. Jesus said, which of these men do you think was the neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? He said, the one who showed mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. I look forward to our conversation with our guests this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bishop Sarah. Well, there's certainly a lot of wisdom there. I know our panel are keen to get stuck in, but if you are on Twitter right now, commenting and following along, you're welcome to join in the conversation that way, as well as submitting questions later. The hashtag for this evening is hashtag who is welcome here. It'll probably take up half your tweet just typing that. <laughs> but other versions of the phrase were already taken, so that's all we could get. <laughs> Christian May, editor of City AM, let's start with you. Um, Bishop Sarah mentioned there the flow of hot money into the capital, and Comres polling for St Paul's Institute last month found that 74% of adults in London agree that it seems easier for extremely rich foreign nationals to get permission to live in the UK than it is for ordinary people from other countries trying to make a living for themselves and their families. What do you think our financial systems tell us about who is welcome here? Well, good evening, everybody. Um, I think that the, the issue of buying access to a country like the UK, buying, uh, essentially buying your citizenship, um, is something which is rightly being scrutinised at the moment. Um, the Home Office, for example, will allow a certain size investment to come with it, fast-tracked or different immigration status and visa status. Um, I can see, on the one hand, a pragmatic... Um, rationale for that kind of policy. If the policy was written on paper and was simply designed to encourage people who would come to this country, invest, 
uh, invest either in their own company or in somebody else's business and ultimately generate employment and tax revenue. That is a sensible policy. It is, of course, in the real world something which has also got grey areas uh, and some uh, rather jagged corners to it. Um, it is undoubtedly, um, I think, a cause for some discomfort that the City of London in particular, whilst it has uh, a very uh, high and, and well-deserved reputation for the general conduct of its financial services sector, it does have a problem with money from opaque sources, with money... Uh, that does not have the level of transparency attached to it that I think we should ought to see. Um, successive governments have done quite a lot to try to untangle the very complicated uh, trails that, 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 that lead to this money from around the world. Um, probably not enough has been done, and there are certain quarters of the world, certain individuals, and indeed certain nationalities, so I think contribute um, to that problem that the government ought to look at more. The only other thing I would say on this at, at this stage is that my perspective on immigration in particular does tend to be coloured by my day-to-day -day interaction with professional services here in the city. And so when I think of immigration in my professional capacity as a journalist here in the city, I tend to think of the multinational teams working in multinational companies, people who the Prime Minister, I think, unwisely described as citizens of nowhere, people who are highly mobile, people who come and go. Um, but I do also have a, a, a personal perspective on immigration which is uh, driven more by my own upbringing. I come from a farming community actually on the Isles of Scilly where I think there is zero uh, international migration. But nevertheless, my bulk of my family farm in West Cornwall and there is obviously a significant element of um, what rather unfairly can be called low-skilled seasonal migration from abroad. And that's generated huge issues for the local um, politicians and for businesses and employers. And I dare say we'll talk a bit more about training and development of uh, domestic talent in the country to complement that. So that sort of breadth of immigration where we go from somebody who's paid a million pounds for a golden visa all the way down to somebody who has saved up for a coach ticket to come and pick flowers in the winter. Um, and those two ends of that debate will generate quite different emotional and political responses. And Bernard, uh, you represent the Association of Leading Visitor Attractions. How welcoming do you think the infrastructure of London is to our visitors? Uh, it varies, um, and it will vary after March the 29th. For tourism, tourism is London's third biggest industry. It generates £33 billion a year. One in seven of people working in London work in tourism and hospitality, and 30% of them are from overseas. Brexit has already happened for the tourism industry. It's not an academic thought. It's not a a concept, it's a living, breathing issue now. We already know that some of our most important overseas markets, <clears throat> we, London, gets more than 70% of all of its overseas visitors from the EU. Just think about that for a second after March the 29th. Uh, and we're already seeing a slowing down in forward bookings from our most important overseas markets to London. That's not because the Tower of London has changed. It's not because St. Paul's Cathedral has put their prices up. Uh, it's not because TfL has done something quirky and new at Stockwell Station. It's because we're not deemed as a predictable destination anymore. And even when you take into account currency fluctuations, you recall that after the June 2016 referendum, the pound plunged by 20%. That's great if you're an overseas visitor, because suddenly the Brit Britain is 20% more uh, cheaper, rather, cheaper for, for the rest of the world. Conversely, it also meant that the rest of the world was 20% more expensive for us Brits, so we tended to holiday at home for two years. But even with a price deduction, I mean, you go to sales, I go to sales, uh, I know how it works. Even with a price deduction, a 20% off bargain doesn't necessarily make it more attractive if the perception is that you're slightly less welcoming to foreigners. And I'll be really blunt in that sentence. Um, I went along to uh, Sir Ian McKellen, glorious actor, is celebrating his 80th birthday this year. And he's doing a tour of theatres throughout the country, huge ones like the National, tiny ones like in Ballymena and Barnsley. And it's to celebrate him, that sounds a bit egotistical, but you know, why not? Uh, it's to celebrate him. 
but it's also as a fundraiser for all of the, um, the theatres uh, at which he's appearing. And he, he ended last night, I was privileged to see him at the Old Vic, I was, he ended last night with a brilliant slap in the face to reality. And he reminded us that the only play that is known to have been written in Shakespeare's hands, the only fragment of Shakespeare's handwriting is the play Thomas More, unfinished, and it's in the British Library. And he collaborated on this play with others. It was a sort of like a Coronation Street effect, really, where you get a number of different writers collaborating and you're not supposed to see the joins. The bit that remains is Thomas More standing outside St. Martin's in the Fields and decrying apprentices from the city livery companies who are appalled at the number of overseas people living in London. Mm -hmm. And they shout out, get rid of the strangers. And just as Bishop Sarah was telling us, the response from Thomas More, cloaked in his philosophy and his knowledge and advocacy of the law, was put yourselves in their feet, put yourselves in their shoes, go to the countries from which they have come, and then say where you are welcome, and whether you want the protection of law, mm -hmm. and solidarity, and internationalism, and comfort, and hospitality. Uh, Britain, and London in particular, is based on international mobility and migration. We are, thanks to the work, the contribution, the loves and lives, of people who've come from around the world. We are infinitely better and richer for it in every sense, not just economically. We need to work hard to make sure that we're still deemed as and perceived as attractive in the future as we have been in the past. That's not just good for our wealth, it's kind of good for our soul. So clearly not a new issue. You've mentioned Shakespeare, Bishop Sarah had um, uh, scripture sort of comparisons. Adrian, when you put this report together, and we've talked about it, I've read the report lots of times, you very much acknowledge that. This is part of the human condition, this tension. Um, and you take us towards some pretty bold recommendations. I'm interested in how you see some of these recommendations specifically fulfilling the notion of the common good that you outline very thoroughly there. So let's look at this one first. It, you um, call for a requirement that businesses in this country train two local people for every one person they hire from abroad. How does that help us to demonstrate welcome? Well, as has already been mentioned, you know, London is so international, it relies so much on foreign capital and foreign labour. But London, of course, is also the capital of a country, and it can't be the case that somehow it gets so detached from the rest of the nation that it will feel like a strange place for many people from outside of London. So, But it does. It has for ages. Yes, it has for ages, but, but perhaps more so in, in recent times than even before, perhaps with the exception of the late 19th century when it was probably equally or similarly international. But I don't think that's ever a good place to be where some of your own uh, nationals feel they're in a strange country because they should just be as welcome in London as everyone else. So it's really all, all about a balance of interest. It's not to say that we should somehow and all forms of freedom of movement. It's just to say, are we getting the balance of interest right in precisely uh, trying to enable everyone to flourish, not just a particular group, be there from your country or from abroad. It's really trying to say the common good is about individual fulfillment and mutual flourishing. If we don't hold that in balance, then we are neglecting some people and we're not welcoming to them. So this proportional um, hiring notion then, so that, uh employers in this country invest in training local people mm. um, proportionate to recruitment from abroad. Do you see that working at every level? How would a, you know, well, not a sole trader because they wouldn't be hiring, but how does a yep. very small business really make that work in practice? Uh, absolutely. There will be very different ways in which that will have to be, I think, implemented if it were adopted. Um, but we know that there is a problem with skills because we've put such an emphasis on universities. And I, I work at universities, so I'm clearly not anti-university education, just the opposite. But it's also the case that not everyone has got academic interests or talents. And to sort of say to someone, you know, in their youth, you're only going to be a success if you go to university and study, that's a, sending a wrong signal. But where are the institutions to train people for a lot of the vocational, technical 
uh, jobs that we need. And these are not low-skilled. These are actually very high-skilled jobs. So we need those sorts of institutions. And I think we also need a commitment. I mean, some uh, governments in, in the recent past have introduced an apprenticeship levy because there's a recognition that the country doesn't offer enough apprenticeships. So I think that's the first step towards saying there is an obligation to give back, not just to take labor wherever you can find it nationally or internationally, but also to invest in your workforce. Because again, it's about the mutual obligations we have towards one another, not just how can I get the best deal for my business or you know, how can I have a single path to success. How would you see that working, Christian, going back to your farming in Cornwall um, example, if the onus was on local employers to be training locally, um, do you think that would work in practice? Well, I mean, first of all, if I think of my mum's restaurant back on the Isles of Scilly, where I worked for most of my younger years, um, it's a seasonal operation in like most tourism economies, and it relies on people who want to travel and work a bit, etc. Uh, one of the phenomenon we saw in the last five, six, seven years was that a lot of the EU talent coming to work in bar jobs uh, were more likely or not to be Spanish and educated to PhD level. That is a consequence of what has happened in some Eurozone economies. Uh, if I think of my family's farming operations in West Cornwall that can employ uh, hundreds of flower pickers, daffodil pickers, over the course of a winter, um, invariably, there will be several hundred uh, who are, in fact, almost all will come from Eastern European countries, uh, new EU accession countries. Um, the difficulty that people, farmers in Cornwall, and this will be across the country and in other agricultural sectors as well, the difficulty they have is trying to hire young domestic uh, people into that particular workforce and they can go to great lengths to try to achieve that but ultimately they have to fill the jobs on offer and they will go to people who are prepared to do them and in fact if I think of my uncle who most of his headaches in the winter flower season come from he actually has to employ other people whose specific job is to ensure that European migrant laborers take their breaks and take their holidays to which they are entitled because many of them left their own devices will simply choose not to so there are huge uh, cultural questions to be answered there, and governments try and do all sorts in this field. Uh, Adrian mentioned the, the uh, apprenticeship levy, um, which is a bit of a mixed bag in its current incarnation. Most employers and employers groups are sick to death of it, and since it's been implemented essentially as a payroll tax, the amount of apprentices starts has gone down each year. So there are problems with that. Um, when we think of foreign uh, individuals coming into the city of London to get away from my agricultural roots, um, we should also view that as part of a conversation about international finance. And, and, and we can talk a bit, I hope, about uh, the capital. It's not just movement of labor, but the movement mm. of capital, mm. which doesn't receive the debate as, um, to the extent that the movement of labor does. So I'm glad that it's been raised, and I enjoyed the report. Um, there's nothing wrong with foreign money. There's nothing wrong with the flow of foreign capital into this country. In just this week, I'll give you three examples. Uh, I can tell you this week, 400 million pound Japanese co-Middle East uh, tech investment fund will be opening its offices in London with a specific remit of investing in fast growth tech companies uh, in London and across the southeast. Patisserie Valerie has been saved and several thousand of the employees have been saved from redundancy thanks to an EU listed private equity firm. Uh, HMV has been pulled out of administration by a Canadian uh, investment firm. So when we talk about foreign money coming in it can be quite often a very politicized sentiment um, and particularly is often the case with complex topics in our political debate, it can be quite, uh, it can be reduced to, to its simplicities, but it is in fact, I think, um, not sufficiently understood in Westminster terms that a lot of this money, um, in fact, I would say the vast bulk of such money and capital flows goes to extremely productive parts of the economy and not just speculative or property investment, um, although some of that does take place. So I will certainly make a robust defense for free flow of capital if I get the chance later this evening. <laughs> well, let's have a look at some of that in terms of the way that that's scrutinized and held to account. In the report, one of the recommendations is that we revise company and investment law to strengthen the duty of directors and investors to manage long-term social resilience risks. So we look at things like a requirement on institutional investors to take account of ecological, social, and governance standards in investment decisions. Bernard, I know that you know something about this. How do you see 
shareholder accountability and investor scrutiny um, working in practice? <clears throat> yes, this doesn't fit naturally into museums and galleries. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but think back to last Friday um, when school kids from across the UK, uh, depending on which newspaper you read, liberated themselves to exercise their political views or bunked <laughs> off because it was a lovely day. <laughs> They decided to express their views about probably the greatest challenge that we have as a, as a, as a planet, um, and that's climate change. It really struck me last night, and again, come back to Ian McKellen, I'm not his agent, by the way. <laughs> Ian McKellen was 80 last night, and it struck me, struck me today that actually a child born today will see the year 2100. They'll be slightly over 80. What, what does that look like? What does that look like in terms of climate change, in terms of uh, our, our environment, in terms of our financial situations, in terms of our politics? One of the things that I do is, is chair the council of WWF, the, uh, the Worldwide Fund for Nature. Um, we're increasingly finding the greatest political leverage and tool, campaigning tool, is to appeal directly to shareholders about ensuring that they keep their staff, their investments to account. And at some various points, drawing a line in the sand or in the snow uh, about exploration in uh, Virunga, for example, in Central Africa, or about Arctic exploration, or about in, uh, exploration in CITES areas, or places of scientific uh, interest or, or, or uh, special protection. I'm really taken by the debates that organizations like the New Citizenship Project are, are furthering about the, the challenge between consumerism and citizenship. And increasingly, the savviest companies and organizations and, uh, I'd argue, governments are, are looking at making the shift to ensuring that people are treated more like citizens and less like consumers, that they're engaged in a participatory democracy, that they engage and experience and can contribute rather than simply consume in a financial transaction. And I think the greater emphasis that we place on this, whether in the financial sector, the economic sector, or indeed the cultural and heritage sector, is to engage more with people on their terms to speak their language, to be held to account for our license to operate by the very people that we purport to want to bring into the door to engage with and to listen to. I think this is a really interesting shift about accountability and the way in which we view people, the merit that they have and the contribution that they can make in the future. And Bishop Sarah, this brings us back to your point that you made so clearly about the search for short-term gain competing with long-term mm -hmm. flourishing, um, uh, moving together as a generation, as generations. Um, how do you see that? Um, do you see this kind of short-termism that you mentioned as a kind of manifestation of greed or sort of necessary urgency given the way that the structure of our financial systems work? I think it's probably a bit of both, actually. Um, I think one of our, for me, one of my observations about where we've come from over the last two years is a recognition that uh, people are less trusting in authority, whatever that looks like. And we, if we're authority, don't necessarily listen. And so I think, I, I do think some of our challenges is around how we encourage people to begin to listen what's really going on. And one of my observations is that we can, in, you know, in our financial heart of our city, begin to make provision for some of these big shifts that are coming. But actually the people that are less able the ordinary person who lives in the city is unable to do that. And I would completely agree with the comment about how companies need to begin to listen and to move from a consumerism to citizenship and actually listen to where people's concerns are. And you, you, we just saw that last week with, with people that may well not be, be 90 in 2000, you know, 2100 who actually decided to take to the streets to take a day off school and say, actually, what's important to me is our environmental future. And so there is something about how we listen to those voices and allow them to genuine, genuinely express it. And I do worry that the short-term 
you know, investment that we see is about protecting the shareholders, which financial companies can do, but it's not about protecting people and the, the people that are less able to cope with what's going to occur in the next two years in this country, and we forget that. We would like to listen to you in a few minutes' time, so if you have written a question on the card that you were given as you came in, would you please hold that up really high so that people can, our team can come around and collect those questions, please, and some of you will be called later. So if you've written a question on your card, hold it up, and then somebody will come and collect it. Thank you. Christian, on that point of um, accountability and listening, this is the sort of thing that one might expect in a church or a room full of nice people <laughs> that we, um, we say, oh, if only we could listen to each other, wouldn't everything be lovely? Um, but if you are uh, you know, if you're in business or finance and you're held to account on financial profit, notwithstanding these multiple bottom lines that we have these days, but how practical is it to make room for conversation and what use would it be if we did that listening? Well, I don't know if anybody here has ever been to Marks and Spencer's AGM, <laughs> but that's one of my favourite demonstrations of, of shareholder activism, invariably along with institutional investors who have serious questions delving into the bottom line, you will have people standing up and asking, using their shareholder rights to ask questions about the recipe of the new biscuits, which they don't like. Or famously, in Jeremy Paxman's case, the quality of the underwear sold at m and So you don't get more of a kind of tangible sense of shareholder activism than an m and <coughs> AGM. But there are more opaque elements to the system. I, I do uh, accept that. If you are a sort of fairly... Uh, enthusiastic, red-blooded, free marketeer uh, like I am, then there's nothing that excites you more than the demonstration of shareholder uh, activism. I tend to always root for the activist investors who want to shake up boards. I certainly root for people uh, who are putting pressure on those that manage their funds or who have funds themselves to move a company's direction on uh, social or environmental issues, I think that tends to be more effective and more immediate than, than government regulation, or, uh, which is another lever that could be pulled, but I certainly favour it when market forces well marshalled can achieve the same end. So I think that um, we are, and certainly in, in the city these days, I think a lot of the social and environmental uh, issues that, that we've discussed and which come up in Adrian's report have absolutely risen up the agenda of individual investors and uh, fund managers. There may be some in the room tonight, and I'm sure they would tell you that they certainly feel more from, A, from their own uh, investors, clients, but also more just being attuned to the way that society is moving, that there is value to be uh, had, extracted even, heaven forbid, from responding to some of these social concerns. And I think that's a positive example of market forces. Um, I appreciate they don't always work like that, but when there are people involved in these decisions, when people choose to exercise their rights as shareholders, uh, people who can exercise their rights uh, in relation to the assets they own, if they're managed on their behalf, those are very enc uh, encouraging steps. I think we should see more of them. But certainly the issues that we're interested in here tonight are rising up the boardroom agenda and they're rising up the agenda of uh, large asset managers and, and fund managers. I think that's to be welcomed. Adrian, um, we want to move on to talking about capital, and you do specifically explore in the report um, recommendations for capital allocation, so looking at uh, regional and social funding needs. Can you talk us through what you mean by that? Who allocates mm. that capital? Where does it go? How would it work? So I think the starting point for that is the problem that a lot of what happens in financial uh, places like the City of London is that you know, finance trades with itself. So John Kay, who's uh, you know a, an economist and financial journalist for a newspaper that shall remain unnamed, lest you know you accuse me of making publicity for it, um, you know has shown in his work that you know only three percent of you know the the financial transactions actually serve productive activities. Now, of course, we need, for instance, lots of financial trading in the city around foreign exchange because that can help in some ways. But it's just the balance again, you know, of, of those proportions that's wrong. And then a lot of that, uh, even that productive capital, tends to be more concentrated in the in London and the southeast. 
So other countries have regional investment banks of some kind that can channel money, or they have banks that work by sector and try and channel money into certain sectors that might be underfunded. So it's really about saying we need a certain institutional infrastructure, and we also need certain incentives and rewards so that the money flows where there is genuine need. Now, it's, it is, of course, happening. I mean, there are industries and services around the country, but it's just the balance between the South, East, and London on the one hand and the rest of the country that I think is the big question. So you need to set up institutions, you need to create incentives, and rewards, and you need, as has already been mentioned, a certain entrepreneurial culture that values that, that doesn't just go for, you know, where are the people? Should we just move to where the people already are and where the jobs are and where the consumption is? Or should we actually try and create uh, a critical mass so that, you know, money can then flow outwards and not all be concentrated in one place? And I think that's the big challenge for policymakers, for business, but I think also for, for instance, you know, all sorts of associations. You know, we were talking earlier about small businesses. How can they do it? Well, small businesses by themselves can't do it. Government isn't always the answer. So what you need are the intermediary institutions that can help businesses. For instance, you know, what we used to call the guilds. If you have a reinvention of guilds for small businesses that can help each other with good practice and resources, and that's a way of also of, of building up smaller size businesses and not just go for big business. And do the free marketeers among us think that would get in the way? Um, no, I think the more people that show an interest in this field, the better. Um, listen, the, the City of London um, and associated clusters around the southeast uh, obviously dominate much of financial activity. Um, it is one of two or three truly global capital cities. Um, but if I may come to the defense of capital markets, um, I, I was quite taken by a piece of research um, carried out last year by the new financial think tank who spent a lot of time thinking about capital markets. He specifically set out to um, try to explore, at least counter the notion that finance <coughs> is overly concentrated in the city of London. And whilst its activity might be, the benefits of a lot of that activity are very well dispersed around the country. They took the example of the northwest of England as a region to explore. Uh, they found that over 900 companies in the northwest of England, who between them employ 600,000 people, raised money through capital markets in one way or another over the course of 2017. There were billions raised by venture capital um, and private equity and other elements of capital markets, supporting hundreds of startup businesses in the northwest of England. The sector of financial services as a whole actually employs directly 100,000 people in the northwest of England. So, any pension fund, anybody with a pension, is a participant in this capital market infrastructure. It may be based, and there may be large buildings and centers of activity in the city, but I do think that almost any business raising funds, any business taking out insurance, any business that requires uh, any kind of financial uh, activity will be part of that capital market, which I think is much more dynamic than those who would claim that it is overly centered in the city of London, because although we don't tend to see it, the truth is there are very few businesses, certainly very few businesses of any scale, that are not in the capital market system taking advantage of a lot of the services and activity which may well be led from London, but whose uh, advantages, I think, are, are more widely felt than is often realized. Speaking of that kind of regional dispersal, and coming back around to the talent question, Bernard, I'm interested in your thoughts, because, of course, many of the UK's leading visitor attractions are not in London, and you mentioned earlier... I, I'll ask you to repeat them, those statistics about how many people work in associated professions. Um, we look in this report at a, a, kind of, um, a national commission on education, skills and investment, and particularly looking at regional investment discrepancies, internal migration, which we haven't talked very much about yet this evening. Um, can you talk us through your thoughts really there on this north-south divide, for want of a better phrase, and how um, you can see uh, the needs or the opportunities around talent development in those areas? <clears throat> well, I draw, I draw on two things. One, um, for several years I used to be chair of the uh, Visit Manchester, the Manchester Tourist Board. <clears throat> and tourism in the Northwest is extraordinarily important. I mean, Manchester, the renaissance of Manchester has been built on the back of heritage, tourism, uh, sport, uh, and museums and galleries and culture. I mean, 15 years ago, Manchester was the 10th most visited city in the UK. It's now the third. Um, and that's because of the city council's investment into culture and arts and tourism and heritage. And because, faster trains. And faster trains, yeah. <clears throat> because guess Still what? Still too expensive. <laughs> a nice place to visit is a nice place to live, is a nice place to work, is a nice place to study. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, not, it's not too complicated. 
Um, and so when we had regional development agencies under the last Labour government, it was really clear which of those regions in England in particular got tourism, got culture, got heritage, and invested accordingly. And tourism isn't just where, tourism and culture isn't just where you grow jobs, it's where you grow people. It's where you grow people in terms of their sense of citizenship or connection with community or intellectual curiosity about where they come from and who they're connected with and sense of, of internationalism. So we need to invest in, in all of that in order to ensure that all parts of the UK benefit from the fact that the UK is the fifth most visited country in the world. I mean, I just remind, we often take this for granted, particularly sat here in the crypt of St. Paul's. Um, you could fit the United Kingdom into one of the Great Lakes of Canada, but we're the fifth most visited country in the world. London is the most visited city in the world. We have three out of the top 10 museums and galleries in the world. We're, we're good at tourism. We're I mean, without sounding a bit braggy, we're genuinely good at tourism here in the UK. I'll just give you a, a, an illustration. Um, more people visit the V&A, the Natural History Museum and the Science Museum, all in South Ken every year than visit Venice. More people visit the British Museum every year than visit <clears throat> the Netherlands and Belgium combined. And Scotland, actually, but let's not game. <laughs> <laughs> Let, let's unite rather than divide. Um, I mean, we're, we're genuinely good. We kind of take it for granted. I mean, tourism is, is our fifth biggest industry. It's our third largest employer. It's worth £127 billion to the economy. And even in the teeth of recession in 2008, and I, my, I suspect that we're going to see it again now, tourism and culture and heritage was creating one in three of all apprenticeships. The challenge for London is to use its place, the kind of gravitational pull that we have as a city, 50% of all visitors to the whole of the UK only come to London. And we're responsible for 51% of all overseas visitors spent in the UK just in London. We have an obligation as well to spread that economic benefit. And with that economic benefit to all parts of the country, including notably Cornwall, uh, we spread the income, we spread the entrepreneurial benefits, but we also spread the job creation as well. So as a gateway city, not just to the world, but also domestically. Tourism allows us to do that, but only if we grasp it, only if we take that challenge seriously. Thank you. We're going to come to your questions in a minute, but before we do that, I'd like to hear from each of the panellists briefly again, now that you've heard each other, um, just to respond a little bit um, and summarise your thoughts, um, especially if there's something that you're thinking about now that you weren't expecting to think about when you arrived here. Um, Christian, do you want to kick us off? Uh, gosh, well, uh, it's encouraging to hear that tourism is as uh, important to the British economy uh, as it felt like it was to me growing up uh, in a tourist uh, island off the coast of Cornwall. Um, but it is also worth stating how valuable to the rest of the UK the City of London is, and how valuable the City of London is to the European uh, economy, the wider European economy. Um, I'm not going to get into the nitty-gritty of Brexit, other than to say that the value uh, of the relationship that has built up between the city and European capitals and institutions is um, underlined each day of, of recent months as small side agreements and side deals are done to ensure continuity of certain key services and sectors and relationships and trading activity in the event of a, uh, a no-deal Brexit, suboptimal as that would be. Uh, so the relationship that the city has to the wider world is of um, staggering value to the British economy and of real value to the regions and nations. Uh, any business, uh, as I said, that is active and participating in uh, capital markets can trace, I'm sure, uh, some connection to the heart of the city here. When it comes to immigration, um, I do think we are up for a great debate in this country on that. There were some positive elements of the government's white paper on immigration. Um, some elements of it were cheered by businesses. Some elements of it caused businesses to uh, put their head in their hands about the associated levels of bureaucracy that might come with change of status of EU uh, migrants to the uh, British economy in particular. I don't detect any great appetite, thankfully, from this government or anyone waiting in the wings to seriously start to unpick uh, 
um, the, um, the roots of mig migratory labour into the country that, that have been built up. I think there is a recognition that they're good. But I would also say, and this is something which comes up in the report, and it leads me to, to uh, quote former Labour leader Ed Miliband, actually, which is not something I do very often. <laughs> um, but he made the observation when he was still uh, active in frontline politics that, uh, that he and others can make the good, uh, make the argument for uh, immigration being an aggregate good. And it is. And I write that column three or four times a month in my own newspaper. It is an aggregate good. It is good for the economy. It is good for wider society and for culture. Of course it is. Ed Miliband went on to say that whilst that is true, people don't live their lives in the aggregate. And so people having much more direct experiences of the way immigration, um, particularly large-scale immigration into certain sectors and certain parts of the country, has affected them. I do think it's legitimate to note that politicians have not taken that seriously enough. And it probably in the immigration debate is too easy for people like me to make the case for golden visas and global capital streams, etc., um, and to perhaps not reflect as much as we ought to on some of the legitimate questions, um, which have also, I think, been stifled in recent years. Um, and Britain now has an opportunity to um, redesign its immigration system, and I hope as it does that, it addresses some of the issues that people have raised um, about their sense of community and identity and place, because it's perfectly possible for uh, all of this to coexist, um, but those conversations need to be had, and I'm, I'm certain that this, this report is a good contribution to that. Thank you. Adrian? Well, first of all, to say, you know, it's wonderful to have so many responses to the report and the question it, 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 it raises or it tries to address. And, and I'm very heartened by two things. One is, you know, the sheer benefits of free capital and free labor. And clearly, those need to be um, uh, clearly stated and also how it doesn't just benefit London and the southeast, but other parts of the country. Uh, also, really encouraged to hear that, you know, big questions around the purpose of finance, the purpose of investment, um, ecological and other questions are, you know, much more on the agenda now of, of uh, the larger businesses than perhaps uh, five or 10 or 20 years ago. I, I would still make this point that, you know, whenever we talk about freedom, we also have to talk about fraternity because it isn't just about opportunities because often they only accrue to some and not to all. And when we talk about um, sort of individual uh, sort of rights, we also need to talk about mutual obligations because without that balance, you know, it's always going to be skewed in favor of, of, in the end, probably smaller groups and not uh, the country at large. And when we talk about immigration or indeed capital, we also need to ask ourselves, if we have a very open system where lots of labor and capital come to the UK, what does that mean for countries where the money comes from? And crucially, what does it mean for the countries where the labor comes from? Now, in some cases, that may be very welcome. If there's high unemployment in some places, you'd want to offer employment to people so that they don't a struggle and certainly don't starve. But what about the social dislocation? What about all the disruption in those countries from large-scale migration? Think of the Baltic states losing a third of their workforce, Poland. It, this may sound great for the people who leave, but what about the families and the societies left behind there? And I think we do need to think in those terms because we don't live in an isolated context. We have obligations to our own citizens. We have obligations to others as well. And if we don't have a real sense of solidarity at the heart of what we do, then I do think we'll miss out and we'll only ever talk about the benefits of these things for some but not for all. Thank you. Bernard. <clears throat> there's, um, there's a section in the report which talks about people and place in politics. And for people, and I'm going to really need help with the quote here, what, what's the tribute to Christopher Wren here? If you seek my, if you seek my monu monument, look around you. <clears throat> if mm -hmm. you seek Christopher Wren's monument, look around you. Mm -hmm. If you seek London's monument, look around it. Uh, London is a, is a palimpsest. It's a, it's a document which, on which has been written countless times and erased and new generations have come in and written and imprinted their own personality and history upon it. We are literally in the place where uh, Saxon kings were and Romans came and the Mithraeum just up the street and uh, in the bowels of the Museum of London um, the, uh, where Roman battles were fought and the contribution of Huguenots and uh, of Jews and the diaspora of every country in the world. We speak 300 languages here in London. We're the most international city in the world. And we constantly, every day, I think, even unconsciously, celebrate 
the place of the world in London and London in the world. And that's our great legacy. That's our tribute. Look around us. Uh, we are an international place and we are better for it. But we need to work hard at that, which, comes, which makes me come to people. Because we are sustained and greater because of the people from around the world who make us a more interesting place. And in particular, in tourism and heritage and hospitality, 40%, for example, of the front of house staff at the VNA are EU migrant workers. Do you know why? Because they mostly speak foreign languages. <laughs> and you know that we, Brits, don't. We're hopeless. We're hopeless. And if we want to be a genuinely internationally welcoming place that the world aspires to visit at some point, we need to get better at that international welcome. And with that comes bilingualism, or at least multilingualism. And the last bit is politics. Uh, there's something called the Nation Brand Index, which looks at how countries are perceived around the world in terms of their political stability, or their economics, or, or their culture, or their heritage, or the contribution to the world. Under George W. Bush, America went down, and it went up under Obama. It's down again, uh, for very obvious reasons. Politics makes a a difference. It colors our view as to whether we want to go to countries or not. And guess what? The way that politics has been conducted over the course of the last six months, certainly, but maybe the last two years, isn't attractive to an overseas buyer, bluntly. I mean, it's not pleasant for us watching the television, but it doesn't make us an attractive, warm, encouraging, hospitable place. We need to improve the way that we conduct our public affairs and ensure that we look like we want overseas people to come here, not just because we want their cash, but we just want the benefit that comes with the osmosis of being next to people who are not like us. Thank you. Bishop Sarah. Uh, I think just following on uh, from uh, Bernard's point, there, there is a reflection for me about immigration, and I would completely agree, you know, uh, just to be around different people is is good for us. And, I, and I'm just struck that at the moment, or potentially with our debate about immigration, we may end up with uh, an immigration policy that, you know, gives golden visas and sets a, sets a salary, you know, sets an income or a salary, um, li you know, lowest limit. But but we won't recruit the people that we need. So, you know, if it's 30,000, you have to earn 30,000 to come into this country. We will not recruit people into our hospitality industry or into our public sector. And, you know, 15% of nursing posts are vacant across the city at the moment. We cannot, even if we train, we cannot train enough people to fill those mm. spaces. And so actually, I think for me, there is a real challenge about immigration. And I wouldn't want us to just focus on the golden visa. That's not what we're about. And, and I also worry that because we begin to talk about zero immigration or borders, that actually people won't want to come. Why would you want to come? if you have a hostile environment. So that concerns me. The second interesting thing was to talk about um, redistribution of um, capital across the country and this, you know, the north-south divide. Um, I, do, I heard the, the, some of the conversation about in, um, entrepreneurial skills. I do believe we have to invest in a whole range of people to develop entrepreneurial skills right across the country. Um, but I am, you know, and I know that there is work in our city companies, in the city livery, in the corporation that invest in education. But I can go not very many miles from here and some of the young men and women in some of our local schools will see the city as no relevance to them at all. They would not imagine they could work in the city. And so I do think we have a job to do about encouraging our young people to see that actually they can come from our community schools, our church schools, uh, and actually there is something for them. And that means that our, you know, the corporation here, the livery companies, the commercial sector here has to do slightly more about going out and saying, actually, we will train you with entrepreneurial skills, whether in London or even wider. And I think there is a job for us to do there. Mm. Thank you. Um, we have some questions from the audience. We have lots of questions. Thank you. I have selected a few and we'll 
call people out to ask them. There's a microphone just over here in the corner. Firstly, though, a few people have understandably and rightly raised the same question, and if I were in the audience, I would have asked it too, which is why in a conversation about welcoming um, and diversity and uh, enjoying what's different about each other, are we all white on this panel? <laughs> so um, I'm with you there. I would have asked that question too. And I can assure you that, as you can imagine, these events take ages to plan. And and um, we did plan for a mixed group ethnically on the, uh, on the panel. And in the last few days, we've gone through quite a lot of changes in our lineup, not least that I wasn't supposed to be chairing tonight, as you can probably tell. <laughs> I just picked this up this afternoon. So sickness, travel, unexpected circumstances means that the panel is quite different to what we thought even just a week ago, let alone before that. And we completely acknowledge that this is not ideal in this kind of conversation. And I apologize to you for that, but I do hope that we've heard some help helpful things this evening, and um, thank you for keeping us on our toes. So I'm going to um, ask these four people to come to the microphone, please, and stand together, and then um, ask their question for uh, a couple of the panelists to answer. Um, we have Eliza Philby, we have Adam Beckett, we have Ian Tutton, and forgive me while well, I just try and read, the lighting's not great at this end of the room. Is it April Alexander? Is that the right name? So if those four people could come over to this corner just here, please. You probably can't see it from where you are, but there is a microphone here. So Eliza's question first, please. Do you want these back, Jodie? Are you okay? You've got them there. Great. Thank um, you. Just thinking ahead and kind of beyond the immigration debate, I wondered if you, the panel could comment on automation, because actually it's been estimated that automation will not only affect low-skilled workers from retail in, and also agricultural, but also high-skilled workers such as accountants and journalists. I think bishops, you may be immune, but automation <laughs> is the looming threat, and indeed, Actually, isn't the debate going to fundamentally change when automation comes into play? It's going to be less who is welcome here and less more about should that machine overtake the human being. Thank you. Uh, Bernard, do you want to take that one? Um, yes. Uh, undoubtedly. <clears throat> undoubtedly. I mean, e everything from artificial intelligence to augmented reality to virtual reality, if I stick to my own brief, and you'll forgive me for that, one of the things that we find from people who go to visitor attractions and actually want to go onto apps and augmented reality and virtual reality, um, some of that can be brilliant. I mean, absolutely brilliant, because at the Natural History Museum, for example, at the moment, you can go on a um, underwater trip with David Attenborough. I mean, actually stop there, isn't that desirable? You, want, you can go on an underwater trip with David Attenborough to um, uh, the Gold Coast and to the Great Barrier Reef. And it allows you to experience things that you shouldn't experience because you shouldn't go there in order to conserve the environmental habitat and the biodiversity in the, in the species. But increasingly, our visitors are saying, I don't want my kids growing up that their experience is attached to a three-pin plug. Mm. Actually, they want the authenticity of place or the authenticity of people or the authenticity of documents, that they're seeing the real thing in situ. So in, in our area, it's a real balance between the progress which can be enabling and liber liberating and, and, and fascinating in terms of automation and AI, and the slight hesitation about, but I don't want that to replace what is real and authentic and experiential and rich. Adrian, do you have something? Yeah, just to add to that, and I, I very much agree with what, what Bernard has said, uh, but I think it's important to uh, realize that really we shouldn't treat any technological invention or anything in the economy as ever sort of entirely inevitable and, you know, and somehow um, sort of pre predetermined. Rather, things are very, very contingent. And yes, if certain trends continue, then we may well lose millions of jobs to automation, artificial intelligence, but this is something which is up for grabs. It's something which we can shape and should shape, and we should precisely shape it according to need. So where technology can help human need and, and you know, our social and ecological 
needs, we should definitely use it. But where it actually goes against them, we should also make sure that it doesn't take over. For example, the idea that, you know, in the care sector where there's incredible need, you know, we're suddenly going to say that somehow it's better to be cared for by robots than by human beings because it's cheaper and more efficient. I mean, that surely doesn't answer the question of the purpose of care or building maintenance or teaching and education and so on. I mean, the human dimension of all of these professions is absolutely vital. So the question should not be what's the cheapest, what's the most efficient, and what's the technologically feasible. It should be what's the purpose. And the question of purpose cannot be reduced to these things. It has to be really about the real value, the meaning of this. Because ultimately, human beings are meaning-seeking animals. Yes, we need an income to pay the bills. But if we don't derive any meaning from our jobs, then we're not going to be fulfilled. Right? And so the question of purpose has to come first and front and center. We shouldn't assume that any trends, technological, economic, social, cultural, political, are ever inevitable. You know, human history is contingent. We have agency. Human creativity should be what drives this, not some anonymous process. Yep, please. Um, I think, as much as it depresses me, that your observation that journalists are for the chop when it comes to <laughs> automation <laughs> or artificial mm. intelligence um, is possibly true quite a long way down the line. Certainly the case that I think traditional white collar jobs are more vulnerable to a to changing um, uh, place in the workforce than actually the jobs that most of the debate about automation has been focused on. Um, the sort of human interaction jobs, the um, slightly uh, manual labor in particular. Um, it's actually exceedingly difficult and expensive to replicate what a human can do. Um, as Adrian said, with their own agency. There was a hotel in Japan who replaced all of their front desk staff with robots, the smartest you can currently acquire. And it was an absolute disaster. <laughs> in the words of the management of the hotel, created more work than they had before. Um, they kept getting things wrong, um, nothing quite worked, and they had to employ more people to stand behind these robots to make sure they didn't completely cock up giving you your key. Um, so I think mean, we're a long way from a point at which we're interacting with, with, with robotic workers in any sense like that. But um, the change that, that is coming and that will shape is one that can be managed. And I also, I think it depends whether you're an optimist or a pessimist. I don't think that these kind of forces, um, these changes, uh, are inevitably going to simply um, remove or obscure people or processes or parts of the economy. I think they will open up avenues for people to do other things. I think they will complement existing ways of working. They may give us more time. They may generate in their own right more jobs, even if that is standing behind a check-in robot to make sure it doesn't <laughs> offend your hotel guests. So I'm more optimistic about this than, um, than some of the reports out there on the matter. Uh, but I, would, um, I mean, it's interesting because actually there's now good evidence that in healthcare you get a much better diagnosis through some of these automated processes. So actually we will see less need for radiographer consultants. Um, you know, so that actually there is much better diagnosis and treatment and accuracy through automation. There is also some good evidence that robots in care homes <coughs> actually improves the quality of living for people. So I, do, I have to in say, addition, I think... Presumably to oh, no, 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 replacing, replacing. That replacing. <laughs> sounds thoroughly so, depressing. Though. Yeah, well, but it, the evidence is there. So I think, <laughs> I'm, I have to say, I'm not, I'm not so, I mean, optimistic. I mean, I think, I think it's naive to think that this won't change us. And I think one of the challenges that we have is those that have power to control their future and therefore to take control of their future, what they do will be successful and maybe find more leisure time, do something different. But there are a whole group of people in the same way as they have in the past, whether it's the mining industry or the dockyards or the car industry, who have lost out because they have not been in control of their future. And I think there is some responsibility for us as a society to actually have much better foresight that this may come. And how then do we do enable those people that maybe don't have so much control over their, over their lives to make better decisions? And for us not just to think this is not going to happen. Great, thank you. Um, Adam Beckett, I think your uh, question is specifically to Bishop Sarah, and you're from the Church Times, is I that am. right? Oh. Great. Um, uh, <laughs> mutual flourishing is clearly kind of uh, the phrase of the decade in the Church of England, well, one of them. Um, uh, and I just wondered, you mentioned that earlier, how else can the Church help welcome people? Uh, and Adrian, specifically, there's a bit in the, in the report about um, Christian social teaching. I just wondered if you could expand on that, please. Mm -hmm. So which of you two wants to go first? 
I don't mind. So, in terms of, um, so in ter your question is about flourish, mutual flourishing and welcoming. Yeah. yeah, so I do think, so I made some reference. Um, I think that we're not alone. You know, we, I suppose we, you know, we at the church ourselves, we have a language, we have a way that sometimes is not, I suppose, is exclusive and not inclusive. So to talk about redemption and sin, people out there have no idea what we're talking about. So one of the things we ought to be doing as churches is in our context, listening to people and uh, having developing relationships with our communities. So in a sense, we, we listen to our communities and that will vary on wherever we are. The city is very different to a rural village. So how is it that we develop relationships with our communities? And so we, we enable people through that relationship to come in and encounter God's love. That will be different wherever we are. There's no one answer to that. And that also will mean increasingly that we may need to move out of our church buildings to do that. And we, we're talking about technology. I mean, a lot of the younger generation are into social media but actually what we know from them is they still want relationships, they still want to build community, and they still want a conversation about, about God, but it is on their terms. And to do that, actually, that we, you know, they're not going to walk in, but we may have to go and find where they are and have the conversation where they are. So that's about us listening and, uh, and in, in a sense, in meeting people where they are and building that relationships to encounter them with. Adrian. Well, thank you. It's it's a really um, it's a really good question, and I suppose I would start by saying um, the reason why Christian social teaching has a lot to offer is because it always challenges some of the conventional categories. So you know we think a lot in terms of either individual happiness or collective utility. So you know just what pleases me at any one point or aggregate GDP, as was mentioned earlier. And what was interesting during the referendum debate at some point when someone brought up GDP and how you know leaving the EU would you know make us all poorer, someone in the audience at one of those debates said, well, it's your GDP. In other words, this is not my daily experience. This is not my lived reality. There may well be an aggregate, but you know, that, that's not reflective of my particular situation. I think that's really important. So mutual flourishing is neither private nor collective. It's essentially all the relational uh, things we can only have in common. It is crucially about our talents and vocations, not just us as consumers or us as um, you know, private citizens on the internet sort of spouting opinions, and I do that on Twitter too. It's really about saying there's a primacy of relationships rather than just transactions or legal arrangements. And why does this all matter? You know, people might say, well, it sounds very wonderful, but it's very abstract. It isn't. In a society which is freer but more fragmented, in an economy that's richer but also with precarious jobs and lots of volatility, that kind of stability matters. Those sorts of, you know, embedded relationships and institutions really matter. In a society where loneliness now affects nine million people in the UK, you know, if we don't talk about mutual flourishing, we are essentially saying we'll abandon people to their fate, which is that of being lonely, ill, just abandoned. And that surely can't be society that's welcoming to its people or indeed to people who, who come to it. So I think mutual flourishing really adds a lot. If we start thinking what it is really about the human person, what gives us that dignity, the meaning, you know, that, that we all need in order to, uh, to become more ourselves in relationships with others. Thank you. Um, let's have April Alexander next, please. Thank you. In the church for a long time, we have discussed peace as being hard work. It isn't something that just happens because you smile at everybody. I wonder whether welcome is also hard work. My current experience is welcoming for the first time uh, a Syrian refugee family and it's, it has, is taking a long time and a lot of cooperation and hard work. Would you agree that welcome is a process and not an event? Thank you. Mm. Uh, Christian, do you want to respond? I think that's exceptionally well put, uh, a process, not an event. Um, I'm not sure there's much more I can add to it. Um, I, so I, look, I would like to hear more about your experiences of the, of the process, as you put it, of, of, of welcoming a Syrian refugee family. I would say on that point, the um, <coughs> distinction between a process and an event is one that I have been thinking about watching uh, the occasional small boat <coughs> approach the coast of Kent with um, what tends to be Iranian national 
um, refugees or asylum seekers in it. And that has been reported uh, as an event. It was described by the Home Secretary as an event deemed to be a major incident. Um, to my mind, that is an event, the tail end of an extraordinary event, if you think about the journey that has been made from people fleeing an oppressive theocracy to uh, cross the channel in a small boat with six other people and um, wash up on the shore in Kent. That's an event, um, rather a, a, a part of a process that I, I think is lost in the coverage of that particular um, episode, which for their own reasons politicians want to describe as a crisis and an emergency. Um, so I think when it comes to the issue of uh, either asylum seekers or refugees, it should be seen more in that holistic way that you've just described it, madam, as opposed to um, the events that it can be portrayed as, um, certainly in our political debate. Bishop Sarah. Yeah, I, I mean, I completely agree with you. I mean, I do think, um, you know, I, I said it, I think we, we assume, I mean, I love diversity, and part of the reason for coming back to London is the sheer diversity. I love to hear people speak different languages, wearing different clothes, eating different food. But I think we, we are wrong to assume that that is easy for people. And certainly having spent time in the Southwest, which has a different type of diversity, um, and certainly to see, uh, you know, some wonderful communities who got together and, again, are housing, you know, Syrian refugees. I know for them the step that that was. And, and that's recognising that difference isn't always easy. You know, that if we are different, it doesn't mean to say we're going to get on. We're going to un understand each other. And so, actually, that, that does require us to work, and not just as a one-off, but to work at it. And, and therefore, welcome is a process, um, and I, I'm not sure we can assume it's ever done um, in that way. And I do also feel that um, the other challenge we have, although in this city, you know, may, may be multiracial, you know, multicultural, that actually loneliness is still really high. And, you know, with something like 11% of people who live on their own over 75 only receiving one visit a month, you know, there, there is a job for us to do it, how we welcome those people who have lived here all their lives but no longer feel welcome and, and aren't visited. So it is a process, and I suspect that those who we welcome and who we build community with, that focus changes over time, and we have to reassess who is it that we're doing, with, doing it with. And absolutely, we should not underestimate that it has to be intentional, and we in it have to recognise where it is tough for us. Thank you. Thank you, April. And our final question, um, Ian Tutton. Thank you. Um, given that large numbers of Londoners are themselves second, third, fourth, fifth generation immigrants, um, how do we create a community which transcends ethnicity, ancestry, and issues such as that? When, when you say transcends, what do you mean? That doesn't force people back into their ethnic ancestral groupings. So it brings people together rather than driving people apart. Thank you. Adrian. Well, like the other questions, really, really important. And, and I think, especially in these times of heightened division, where perhaps a lot of the underlying problems that have been building up for some time are now much more out in the open, you know, this emphasis on building a common life is so important. And if, if democracy is one thing, then it is, yes, about voting and about you know, peaceful transfer of power and all the things we would associate with the political process. But democracy more fundamentally is about building a common life, you know, a sense where power and wealth doesn't lie with some, but essentially can be shared. I mean, Martin Luther King has got this beautiful phrase where he basically says that America needs to become a democracy, which it's never been, which means people as partners in power. So together exercising agency, you know, some control over your life, some way of shaping your, your own destiny and not just uh, leaving it to others. And I think what's so uh, crucial is to think of it in terms of something civic that you can share, so not ethnic or, or ancestral or, or even purely linguistic or cultural, but a civic identity you can share. In other words, education into citizenship, which is true of all, indigenous as well as immigrant. I think it also means generally trying to extend democracy into parts of uh, the economy and society where we haven't had it. So much more power for workers, so power at the workplace, I think, is really important so that people feel they have a stake. 
I think power in terms of housing associations, other institutions that sort of feel they have a, a greater control over their daily lives. Also governance arrangements, since we were talking about the economy earlier, you know, when it comes to the railways or the utilities or schools or hospitals, why could we not include the people who are at the receiving end, the patients, the passengers, right, into some of the governance arrangements so that at least their voice is heard? Uh, and I think that's really what a democracy uh, in the end has to do. It has to give everyone a sense that they have a role and a place in society. They can make a contribution and receive a reward. Because if you don't have that balance between contribution and reward, then a lot of people will, again, feel left out, ignored, uh, and you know, we, will, we will be back to all the divisions that we're seeing now. Bernard? <clears throat> um, my paternal grandfather came from Ireland to fight in the Second World War for the British Army, and my mother came over from Ireland uh, to work in the NHS. Um, we're a city of migration. We're, we're a city of contribution. And sometimes, when I was a kid, I used to get dragged along to Irish dances. <laughs> <coughs> You're only beginning to fully appreciate the sheer horror of <coughs> seeing my parents sort of fall back into a a false nostalgia of the Ireland that they left and wanting to kind of recreate that. And it's only as I got older that I realized that actually those, those communities where you bring people together and you provide a kind of almost a cultural respite from the rest of the world are actually incredibly empowering and enabling and safe. And safe is a really important thing where we have a government talking actively in their own language about hostile environment. Uh, sometimes you want to retreat back into your own tribes, if you like. And I, I know that as a, as, a, as a gay man. I mean, I, I retreat back into my logical family, not just my biological family. I want to be with other people like me. And that in itself poses challenges to the Church of England really grappling in a critically honest way with who it welcomes. I and my husband can't have our legal marriage blessed in this cathedral. You're more likely to be blessed if you're a dog or a donkey in the Church of England than if you're a gay couple. Let's be really critically honest about who's welcome and who we let in through the doors and who we extend the Benedictine spirit of hospitality and welcome to, because it's not as straightforward as it looks. It is not as straightforward as it looks. And as we were reminded in one of those incredibly articulate questions, it's hard work. But thank you very much for joining us this evening. I would like um, to invite the Dean to come back, please, and close the event. Thank you. Just, just two short reflections. One is, Bernard, thank you. That's a note of reality with which we struggle. And it's a good point on which to end, that there's so much more to do before we're, we're where we want to be. Um, thank you. And the other thing is to say thank you to you for being willing to, uh, in the words that were used in answer to the first question about automation, actually to be here in the flesh and to take part in this as a real event and a real experience and not something on the end of a, a wire that comes down. It's great to have you with us this evening and we're so glad that you've been here. Uh, we're going to continue the conversation for a little while over drinks next door. Um, in order to do that, we're going to can I ask you just to remain seated for a minute while we take our speakers out so we can take them out, de-mic them, put a drink in their hand and they'll be ready to receive you warmly around Nelson and Wellington and other dead people who are out there. <laughs> Uh, for our living conversation. Um, uh, but would you please join me as we go in thanking very warmly our chair and our panel for their words of wisdom, their honesty, their graciousness, and their provocativeness to us. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.